want to welcome you to today's webinar on coachability. We are very excited to um, talk about this important topic today, especially as people are coming on. How about we'll start with a few introductions today of who will be presenting um, on coachability. So we have Jack Zanger, our, our guru of all leadership. He's the co-founder and CEO of Zanger Folkman. He's a world-renowned expert in the field of leadership development, a best-selling author, and a fantastic speaker if you ever have the chance to hear him. Uh, we also are so pleased to have Kevin Wildey join us today. Uh, he has written the book on coachability, The Leadership Superpower, which is incredible. He is the expert on this topic, and he is currently serving as the Executive Leadership Fellow at Carlson School of Management. We're so pleased to have him today. I'm Brianna Corin. Um, you might have heard of me on our leadership podcast. I'm over here at Zanger Folkman doing content and marketing. And on our chat today, we have Tracy Consolini. She is our regional vice president. She will be our chat host. So give her all of your questions on coachability. She might answer them or she might refer you to our two experts today. But no matter what, we're going to answer your questions that you have on this really important topic. So like I said, don't leave us. We are going to have a, a book drawing at the end. So be sure to um, stick around till the end. And we're really excited to announce most of all that Zenger Folkman's newest development experience, Coachability, is now available. You go to our website, you can read all about it. And what you're going to see in this webinar is just a little tiny taste of that coachability experience that we now have for leaders everywhere. We realize that there's been this gap in the leadership development industry and organizations have invested a lot in development and coaching efforts. They haven't always seen the growth that they wanted to see. And as we study this, as Kevin studied this, we found that a big part of that reason is coachability and preparing leaders. So I'm excited to turn the time over to Jack today to get us started. Thanks very much, Bree. I am really delighted today to have this opportunity to do this webinar with my very esteemed colleague, Kevin Wilde. Uh, the person you see on the screen is sitting in her office and her manager has just dropped by closed the door and said to her, I have a suggestion for you. The picture you see is of, of, is of her. How is this conversation going to play out, do you think? What will be the biggest hurdle? Let's assume that this is a good manager and that a good coach, good co coaching skills. So will it be a really successful kind of discussion? Uh, and will the success of it depend upon the skill or the style of the person giving the feedback? Or will the recipient determine the success of this interaction? I suspect a lot of you maybe looking at her picture would say, it's gonna have some challenges. So the agenda for today is as follows. We're gonna begin by talking about the case for coachability and help you understand a little bit of the background of it. We're gonna explain what it's what it is, what it means, what's the framework for the coachability research, and then the starting points for how you would get going and doing it. So one of the things that's happened in the 65 years that I've been involved in the leadership development world has been this enormous explosion of the idea and the use of coaching as a key component an amazing change, an amazing growth rate. It's, it's happening at all levels, from the very lowest levels in the organization's hierarchy, all the way to the very senior people. It, interesting to me is that probably 30 years ago, I was sitting in a meeting of chief learning officers and HR VPs, and one of them very was we were very proudly telling the rest of us that, that his organization had engaged coaches to work with the bottom one and 2% of all their leaders, uh, that they were using coaching as a way of helping those who were poor performers possibly avoid becoming terminated. Some of us, even at that time, were a little bit taken aback by that idea. 
but it was true. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, coaching was primarily focused on people not performing well. Now it's completely the opposite. Maybe it's been um, uh, the result of the fact that the very best athletes were the ones who hired coaches to help them become better. But the research that I've seen of late says executives prefer coaching as their primary vehicle for learning to be a better, a better leader. So it's, a, it's been a dramatic change in this whole world of, of how coaching gets used. But the fact of the matter is that nearly all of the attention has been focused on the coach. Um, and yet we've kind of known in our heart of hearts that, that the coaching success uh, requires a very positive relationship between the coach and the coaching. Years ago, a, a marriage counselor that uh, I knew kind of made the observation that her experience as a practitioner was that in any relationship, the person who cares the least and behaves the worst controls its success. And that is certainly true of coaching. In the past, minimal attention was paid to the person being coached. And that's now going to, we hope, change. So with that, I would invite my colleague, Kevin Wilde, to tell you the backstory of coachability. Thank you, thank you, Jack. And I think the shift to coaching is a positive thing. And now the shift to coachability is so important uh, for us today. My backstory on this topic is years ago, a number of years ago, I was the chief learning officer, uh, major corporation, and I had a chance annually to meet with the CEO and senior team to talk about the top 500 leaders, all officers, all directors worldwide, uh, who's ready for promotion, how do we plan succession, uh, things were on a roll. We had a great team, uh, lots of talent. But I started noticing year after year, there were a few names missing from the high potential list. In other words, they were on the list last year and they were not on the list. And as I dug into it, not only were they not on the list, they were not in the company. Uh, and I started doing a study on, hey, what, what's going on here? And if I could go to the next slide, what happened to the, those select few was their career drilled. Now, this is a simple explanation of it. If you look at the, uh, you know, the Y axis, as we move in a career, we increase scope and scale of responsibilities from frontline supervisor to middle manager and beyond. And over time, the X axis, um, there's a pivot point. And what I found in my study is these few leaders did not accelerate their potential, uh, nor did they even flatten out their potential for moves. They, in fact, uh, were demoted or terminated. And, and I started saying that that's something that we need to avoid. Um, so I started doing an investigation on every case, would interview the manager, oftentimes the team around them, and I would dug into their personnel file. And what was most fascinating was their last 360 of record as others rated that leader. The same question came up time and time again that was significantly different than the rest of my population. And it was this question, does this leader seek and respond to feedback. As a matter of fact, let me give you the number on the next slide that I found the drill leaders were 30% lower as seen by others on that interest in getting feedback and responding to it. And I think what once was a strong coachability habit failed and faded away and they developed blind spots that were significant and they mattered. And so that got me on the path of, gee, what is coachability? How do we maintain it? Uh, and there's some powerful research. I went back and I, I uh, talked to my friends at Zenger Folkman on, hey, what do you have in your database? I also did some academic research on the topic. Um, and Jack, I'll, I'll turn it back to you to talk of just a slice of that great research we found. Yes, it wouldn't be a Zenger Folkman webinar without having you see some data. Uh, and so the data we want to show you is the relationship between coachability. This is a study of more than 50,000 leaders across the, the horizontal axis is their coachability, the degree to which they really actively and, and, and effectively practice self-development. And on the, on the vertical axis, their perceptions of 13 other raters on, on average in terms of their overall leadership effectiveness. 
And what you see here is this very powerful relationship between perceptions of being coachable and perceptions of being overall a highly effective leader. And not only did this impact them as the leaders themselves, but it also affected the people who reported to them. And so here you have again on the vertical axis, the employee engagement scores. And these were the scores that the, the subordinates reported about their own level of engagement in the organization. And on the, vert, on the horizontal axis is coachability as seen by the people who were these direct reports about their boss. And what you see is that when the boss is more, is perceived as being coachable, the level of their subordinates engagement goes up rather dramatically. So it's, it changes how people are perceived as leaders and that spills down to the, the people who report to them. So those are the, the, the two findings we want to share with you right now. So Kevin, what is yeah, we'll, bu we'll build it from there. And, I, and I've got to say that I do love the uh, evidence-based approach that Zenger Folkman takes to development and leadership. And we're just giving you just a small part of the case that not only does being coachable help you avoid blind spots and derailment, but it's a better leader in so many ways. And we can go on and on. But let me just jump to the core here, which is a definition we had come up with. And it's three parts. That what is a coachable leader? It's, first of all, someone that values self-improvement. Uh, someone that feels that, hey, I'm still a works in progress and I'm curious and I want to learn. And secondly, they operate, in fact, in that learning zone. We'll talk about that in a second. But then they stay there with four specific practices of seeking, responding, reflecting, and acting. So we'll come back to those definitions, but what we wanna shift now then is to some more insights on what we found in coachability, what we believe, and how to get better at coachability. And I think we're gonna to go to a poll next. So the question is, and if we could uh, all please uh, give us uh, your opinion on this, if you think about your own career or the career of others you've seen, where were you most coachable? Was it frontline supervisor? Uh, early as a middle manager, more as a senior manager, uh, or later in a career as a senior executive. So if you could go to the poll, love to get your opinion on at what point were you most coachable? And Jack, you, you, you've experienced all of these levels, so I won't ask you particularly, but I'm sure you're, you're gonna vote on this as well. Uh, I've got my own opinion. <laughs> you know, um... I, I think I was probably more more coachable when I was a, a, a you know in my early part of my career when I was just having my first subordinates. Uh, I, I would I would like to believe I haven't lost that entirely, but but I believe I was most coachable when I was in my earlier days. Absolutely, I think we all get there. In fact, uh, the. Uh, the, the vast majority of the poll here shows that uh, over a third said early career middle manager was also very strong and then it kind of tailed away. Uh, and that's been my experience as well, let me move on to the next slide, which is what we found went back to this great da Zenger Folkman database and looked at 50,000 leaders 360s not just rail leaders all leaders worldwide all industries and what we found when we cut coachability by level is sure enough, frontline supervisors were seen as the most coachable. In fact, it was 71% positive. And then the slide happened that by the time you got to a more senior executive, the perception was you're well below 50% on coachability. And of course, I think has, this has implications for avoiding blind spots. It means that we're not getting the benefits that we had early in a career in terms of being coachable. Uh, and I think also for those of you that are in the business of developing leaders, that there's an implication here. And that is your leaders have less interest in feedback and getting better naturally. And that gets in the way of learning new things that they have to learn. As we are digging into, well, what is going on here? By the way, this uh, chart could also be displayed for age. That is, we get older, coachability goes down. Uh, also other studies I've seen, tenure and role, the longer you're in the role, uh, um, on and on. But we did find high level coachable leaders at all levels. We want to talk about that, but let's look at what are the problems behind it. 
enter the faulty assumptions. So what we found is there's about a half dozen assumptions that either we start believing or others start treating us in a certain way that we believe contribute to this decline. I want to give you a sample of three. The first one I call the false finish line. And you may have seen that in yourself or in others, that notion about, hey, I'm now the boss. I've been promoted. This whole getting feedback business, I'm kind of done with that now. I want to show my stuff. And certainly you've earned the promotion, you've got skills and experiences, but the learning doesn't stop because the world doesn't stop. And I think for my Durrell leaders, they were guilty of this assumption and that stopped their learning. There's a kind of corollary to that and that's the second faulty assumption I'd like to share. And that is, I call it the superhuman stance. And in my teaching and coaching work, I bump into this often and it's kind of the corollary. And it's a notion about, I'd like to ask for feedback, even though I've been promoted and I'm doing things, but it's going to be misperceived as either weakness uh, or I'm doubting myself. Uh, the imposter syndrome might be part of this as well. But again, the, the end result's the same. I'm not actively seeking input, ideas, feedback from others, and blind spots start creeping in. Uh, before we go to the next slide, I want to tell you about one evening when I was starting to write the book. I was having some fun. I was playing around with a Google uh, functionality called uh, Google Trends, and you can put in different trend terms and see how people are actively searching for things. So I put in two terms. One term, how do I give feedback? And the other term I put in was, how do I receive feedback? And there was a dramatic difference, and it was 10 to 1. So what Google was saying was around the world, uh, people were getting more input and interest in how do I give it versus getting it. Now, let, let's be clear, giving feedback is a tough job and we want it to go well, we wanted people to understand it, we wanna maintain the relationship. So I think it's great that we're asking. The gap is this, and I think it's also the faulty assumption. We're overlooking the other side. And in fact, I would say it's easier to give feedback if I knew the other person was Googling on how do I receive feedback. Uh, by the way, I've done the same thing in terms of uh, YouTube searches, blogs, posts. Um, there's an overweight, and, and to Jack's early point, we're training managers to be coaches, to give feedback, and that's great. We should do it, Zenger Folkman does it, but we need to start feeding the other side of the equation to match up, and that is how to be coachable. And with that, I think we need to shift to another survey here, another poll that's gonna lead us into some of the insights and findings. Um, Jack, I think I'll let you take this one for the poll. Okay. Kevin, I'm really surprised that the ratio was 10 to one. I would have guessed it would have been more like 100 to one in terms of people Googling whether to become better at giving or receiving. Anyway, the, the second poll would like you to respond to is this question. Is there a relationship between coachability and people's self-confidence. So at whatever stage in the hierarchy you might be or whatever time of life you are in, what's the relationship between your personal level of confidence and your receptivity to feedback or, and being coachable? So you see those four options there. So we would again appreciate you weighing in on that as, uh, as quickly as you can. and. Uh, just to see what your feelings are about the relationship between someone's self-confidence and their coachability. So let's see here, Terry, what kind of results we get here. Okay, so higher confidence, more coachable, lower confidence. So obviously the two that get the, the most uh, are high high confidence and moderate confidence confidence well let's show you what our, our data shows so here we have this this grid again that that shows coachability on the uh, vertical scale and levels of confidence on the on the horizontal and as I think maybe we, we sense, there's this, it, it isn't a simple, it isn't a simple conclusion. Uh, indeed, what you see is, is this uh, not a bell-shaped curve, but there's a curve. And what that curve depicts is that for people with really low self-confidence, 
they they are not as prone to ask for feedback. And if that level of confidence kind of rises, that moves them more into the, the learning zone. And as, as Kevin has noted, uh, being coachable is putting yourself deliberately in the zone of where you want to learn. You believe you can be a better leader, no matter how good you are right now, and so you're willing to be to you know, to, to, to learn. On the other end, however, if if people have an excessive amount of confidence, and if if indeed you kind of define that as becoming more kind of arrogant and and, and not responsive to, to feedback, then it's this I don't care zone. It, it's that superhuman stance, you know. I must be good or I wouldn't have been promoted and I don't need to have any more you know, feedback from people around me. Um, and so for that person, an increase in, in, in their humility brings them back into that middle learning zone. So the point that we're wanting to make is the people who are most coachable are those who clearly want to continue learning. And too little self-confidence gets in the way. And an excessive amount, if it can be defined as, as arrogance, that also gets in the way. So it's that middle ground that seems to be the real sweet spot, the, the real place of, of um, greatest value. And I think this, um, the, the CEO of, of the Cliff Bar Company, Sally Grimes, really said it in a very elegant way. Humility is not the opposite of confidence. It's the freedom for learning. And that's what we, we have found is certainly the, the precursor to this. Now, the final thing that we'll say is a background of this uh, whole topic of, of coachability is that there clearly are some attitudes or mindsets that people have that really make it more likely, make it more comfortable. And the first one is that fundamental assumption that, that you have that other people really have my best interest at heart. If I receive feedback from other people, they're not, they're not doing it in a mean-spirited kind of a way where that isn't their purpose, is this gonna put me down? but they really do have my best interests at heart. And the second kind of important mindset is that, that it is that confidence that if there's something wrong, I can fix it. You know, I, I, I'm not lacking malleability. It's not that I can't change things if I want to. And, and the third kind of attitude or mindset that seems to be very important for people being coachable is that, um, you know, it may be a little uncomfortable for a moment when you get some feedback, but it, it's short-term uncomfortable for long-term being more comfortable and long-term progress and growth. Happens I have a few grandchildren and uh, on occasion they'll say something like, oh, I don't wanna do that, I, that makes me uncomfortable. And I've said to them very, very um, strongly, hey, listen, the only time in my life when I've really grown is when I deliberately made myself uncomfortable. So don't, don't go through life thinking that the purpose is to always remain comfortable. And the final um, mindset that, that seems to be very important for people to be to, to stay in the learning zone is that the realization, and this is, I guess is particularly important for senior leaders, is to realize that the praise and the adulation and all the commendation you receive, that there may be some grains of truth in, in much of it, but you know, it's not the, it's not the complete story. And so realizing that that unless you deliberately do something to, to get honest, true messages, you're probably not hearing the complete story. So uh, with those four attitudes or mindsets as the background, 
let's talk about the behavioral elements of being coachable. Kevin? So the notion is, uh, and I'll go back to this definition we're putting out there is uh, coachable leaders uh, at all levels have three things. Number one, that mindset and those attitudes that Jack just talked about, self-improvement, humility, the right amount of confidence uh, to keep themselves in the learning zone. And what we found in studying highly coachable leaders at all levels is they had habits, they had practices. And one of the things we're gonna be bringing forth in the training is what are some new techniques we can bring in to help leaders get back into that learning zone? And the four I just wanna to touch on quickly, uh, seek, respond, reflect, and act. And a couple tips here that you could pass along to the people you're training or try for yourself. So once you're interested in getting better and being coachable, um, the first thing you've gotta do is you've gotta go out and, 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 and get some feedback, get some observations from others. And two things we'd share is number one, uh, have a question, have something you're curious about, you know, asking what's one thing I could change or one idea to help my team. Uh, I love the question about, hey, here's something I'm working on. Can you give me any tips or uh, how you're seeing me do it? Uh, and then also, in addition to seeking feedback and input, seek coaches around you. Let's go back to that slide, please. I'm still on seek. Thanks. Uh, and that notion about having trusted advisors and coaches, internal, external, to give the perspective. Uh, I love the seek question. Hey, I got some input here. Before I dismiss it, what do you think? Or if you're me, what to pay attention to? The best leaders I know are both actively seeking input and nurturing truth tellers around them. So that's a few ideas and a few ideas on seek. The second thing is then once feedback shows up, how you respond is so critical. And the best coaches we know have kind of a muscle memory that they don't get into a defensive attack mode or an, an ignore mode. They get into, hmm, I'm curious. You know, I'm gonna suspend judgment. Let me, let me understand more. And they've got these kinds of responses automatically wired that when they get feedback or they're getting coaching from someone, uh, they're thanking them. They're saying, hey, I want to take a note on this, or can you give me an example, elaborate. So they're curious to dig into it. And that, again, is a muscle that you've got to develop. The third thing then is you've got to step back and think about it. Not all feedback is worth acting on. I think responding well is, but then acting is based on quality reflection. So the highly coachable leaders take that input, take that trusted advisor uh, feedback, and they step back and they think about, is there any evidence that really would say this is important for me to consider? Or is there an underlying message or am I connecting the dots here? Uh, so they spend some time reflecting on input and getting into a positive mode on should I act on this or not? And then the other thing we've seen is the best leaders we know spend time in their calendar reflecting in general. Okay, we're on to act. Uh, and the notion is once you do decide as a highly coachable leader, I wanna do something about it, They've got to get a, a game plan. They've got a way of getting into the, if you will, the personal change process. A couple ideas we've seen is that notion about, I'm not changing everything. I'm just going to experiment with this one thing. And that's an easy way into it. Looking for those first small steps of something new to get momentum going. And then finally, whether it's truth tellers or other people, engineering support around you. So if you will, that's the whole cycle. And again, just to review, highly coachable leaders make a big difference not only av avoiding blind spots, but they have a mindset of, I wanna get better. They have find ways of keeping themselves in that learning zone if with enough confidence to listen and ask, but enough humility to be curious and to think about new ways of doing things. And they've got a set of habits and practices that keep their coachability alive. So that's a few tips. Obviously there's more that we could share, but Jack, I'm gonna turn it back to you for the last part. Okay. So I just want to tell you a quick story. Um, and Kevin doesn't know that I'm going to do this, but a few years ago, Kevin came out and spoke at one of our leadership summits, gave a presentation on a really interesting topic. And um, after being home for two or four days, he picked up the phone and, and called me and said, uh, Jack, I'm going to do that presentation again for, for another group. And uh, I've got a favor to ask of you. And I said, why, of course, Kevin. And so he said, uh, give me one suggestion about what I could do that would make that presentation better. Luckily, I'd pretty paid attention to what he'd said. And so I, I, I had thought of something at the time. I thought, you know, if he had done this, it would have been just a little bit more helpful to 
to me. And so I passed that idea on to him. Uh, Kevin, you know, thanked me for that. And uh, we exchanged pleasantries and he hung up. And I sat there at, at my desk and said, now I know why that person has been such a success in his career. Um, he kind of asked me one specific thing that he could do. He wasn't fishing for compliments. He wasn't trying to have me kind of give him praise. Uh, and it was, a, it was a very memorable lesson. And so when I first heard about this idea and his research on coachability, I was really um, struck and thought that it was an important message that more people could really benefit from. So I would invite you as for yourself personally to you know, think about, is there one takeaway from this presentation today, one, one idea that's kind of struck home with you? And if so, what would that be? And, and, and to then what's the one, one thing I can do that, I, that would make me more coachable during this coming week? Is there one thing I can take away? And as you think about your role in your organization, for those of you who have some kind of function in the leadership development world or in the HR world, or whether you're a, a line manager, um, I would invite you to kind of think about where can I apply coachability in, in my learning and development role? Uh, first of all, who would benefit from it? And are there some people going through one of our company initiatives or programs who, if they had kind of begun that activity with some measure of their own coachability and how they could become personally more coachable, who would have benefited from that? And are there some major initiatives going on inside your organization that if if they had this precursor of helping people be aware of the degree to which they were coachable, would that make a difference? So I would in, invite you to think about it both from a personal point of view and from an organizational point of, point of view. Um, hey, Jack, Jack, if I could add one thing or th thank you for yeah. the, the, the kind comment. I, I, trust me, every time I ask that question, everyone's got material. <laughs> so uh, I'm still a works in progress, trust me. But, you know, having been in the chief learning officer role, I've got to say again, for those of you out there that are working so hard to build a great culture, to build talent for retention and, and, and strengthen your pipeline, I wish I would have had some coachability material to bring into the programs. And if you think about the programs you've had right now, whether it's leadership development for new managers, uh, whether it's uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion material, you know, if someone walks in the room or logs in and they're not coachable, it's hard. And the notion about how to help them own their own coachability, I think is the accelerator. And I'm very excited to partner with, with Jack and the team on, on getting this tool and this, this, if you will, this message out there that I think is gonna make uh, learning and cultures better. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so I have personally been in this leadership development world for 65 years. And I would just make the, the, the observation that this idea, this concept, this, uh, this thing we've been talking about is probably one of the two or three most important, most helpful initiatives that I've seen come along. And so we're gonna have a quick word from, from Brianne describing for us a little bit about the, the product. And so I'll turn the time to you, Bri. All right, thank you so much, Jack and Kevin for the, those amazing insights. And I, I learned a lot from it as well. Um, so I wanted to highlight just a couple of things from the new program that is now out. Uh, first, you might be wondering, well, who needs coachability. And I think it's pretty clear from this webinar that everyone could benefit, especially those senior leaders. Um, but we would say, like Jack was saying before, if your organization is looking into doing any sort of development or coaching initiative, this program would be very helpful as a precursor. But 
really it can benefit anybody at any point in their career. And coachability really allows organizations to maximize time and investment from all development opportunities. And that is what is so exciting about this is to help people go into training um, with a more coachable mindset and understanding how to uh, utilize their coachability. So um, a little bit more um, at Zanger Folkman, we strive to be innovative and flexible with all of our trainings and coachability is now offered live online, in person, and of course, it can be customized to meet your team or organization specific needs within your workspaces. So some of the objectives of coachability, um, you can see on the screen there, we want to increase self-awareness regarding your openness and responsiveness to feedback. A lot of people don't realize that they are not coachable, that they are kind of blocking the feedback that is coming their way. We This program seeks to increase comfort in asking for feedback and how to go about doing that and improving the immediate response that you give to those who give you feedback. And also we wanna elevate willingness to act and implement the useful feedback that you receive so it goes over all of these very important steps that Kevin start, started to highlight today. We also have sustainment tools. We realize that coachability cannot be developed in just an hour or two, but that we have different things to help it really be solidified in people's minds. And we have certifications available now to help you to have internal um, trainings being done. We know um, that if I were to summarize it, right here on the screen that coachability increases the payoff from all development initiatives by helping participants to be aware of that resistance, develop positive responses to feedback from others and create valuable new habits. So we're excited it's out there. If you want a demo or a conversation, you can go to our website and to read more about that new coachability program. But we want you to experience the whole thing. So we have a couple of great opportunities coming up. Um, our special offer is for you to attend the Coachability Live Online Session, which is going to be happening August 22nd at the end of the summer. The special promotional price is right there on the screen of 250 So grab it before the it fills up because it will fill up. And we'd love for you to be able to experience that um, for your organization. Or the other option that you have is that we will have live online or in-person pilot programs that are also being offered. You can indicate your interest in either of these opportunities in our exit survey that will launch at the end of this webinar. So be sure to let us know about that. And last but not least, like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, you have an opportunity. If you fill out our wonderful exit survey, you can win a free coachability book um, and like I said, at the end of this webinar, you can see that bit.ly link right there. You can be sure to enter that. I would just say as a plug, um, if you don't win the book today, that that is an incredible book. I skim a lot of leadership books for my job and for the things that I have to do. I read every page of that book and I go back to it. It is really powerful. Kevin's work is incredible. It's simple. It's really profound. And so add it to your summer reading list if you haven't read it already. And last but not least, thank you for coming today. Thank you for your feedback. And we look forward to being with you next month as we continue to talk a little bit about coachability and digging into entering the learning zone.